So hello, my name is Robert Toombs and I'm uh, president of the RCA. And uh, just a, a few short words uh, about that. Uh, we're an artist's organization. We've existed since 1880, which is, is it, none of us were alive then, however. And um, we have over 650 members in uh, art, architecture, design. We support a wide diversity of uh, the different disciplines of what we call visual culture. And uh, we, we are, our head office is in Ottawa in Canada. And I know that we, I haven't been doing a, 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 a religious uh, checking of the identities of people who've registered for the talk, but we've got uh, people from Switzerland and Germany and uh, Italy and uh, UK, United States and Canada and probably, and uh, Poland and Switzerland. So we have, we've, we've got a lot of, uh, a lot of um, different, uh, different uh, geographic uh, locations tuned in here, which is great with this, uh, this relatively new technology. So um, uh, I just want to start out by acknowledging that today's Zoom lecture is being broadcast from Ottawa, Canada, where we occupy the unceded lands of the Algonquin Nation. And um, I, as I said, I'm Robert Toombs, and thank you for joining us um, for this very special talk by uh, our guest presenter today. Almost 35 years after his death, Andy Warhol still has a vast presence in our artistic culture. In his keynote lecture for the art, a art critic and writer Blake Gopnik argues that this presence depends on the vital place of appropriation in the artist's work and career and how that underlines the role that appropriation has played in forging the very idea of art in the West. And Joanne will, will, will do the intro in French and then we'll invite Robert Endright to introduce our guest speaker. Joanne? Euh, merci Robert. Euh, premièrement, je tiens à souligner que la conférence d'aujourd'hui euh, est diffusée depuis Ottawa au Canada où Ottawa occupe des terres non cédées de la nation algonquine. Mon nom est Joanne Charette, je suis la secrétaire de l'Académie royale des arts du Canada et cette conférence est à, et euh, euh, plusieurs personnes de plusieurs pays y assistent. Donc je ne veux pas tarder et Juste vous mentionner que presque 35 ans après sa mort, Andy Warhol demeure encore très présent dans notre culture art artistique. Dans la conférence d'honneur qu'il donnera pour l'Académie, le critique d'art Blake Gopnik avance que cette présence repose sur la place vitale de l'appropriation dans l'œuvre et la carrière de l'artiste et comment cela souligne le rôle joué pour l'appropriation dans la formation de l'idée même de l'art en Occident. Et maintenant, j'aimerais inviter M. Robert Enright à nous présenter notre conférencier de ce soir. M. Enright. Merci, Joanne and Robert. Um, I'm delighted to be here. Um, you know, one of the paradoxical things about fame is that its main effect is to allow people to know very little about you. Fame is a kind of mask. It's a way of being recognized, but not a way of being known. Now, Andy Warhol is arguably the most famous artist of the last half of the 20th century, but that fame is largely composed of Campbell soup cans, an extremely bad wig, and a public personality that's enigmatic enough to rival mysteries like the Sphinx and Mona Lisa's smile. Now, what Blake Gopnik's monumental 962-page long biography of Warhol makes clear is that there's an enormous amount to know about this profoundly influential artist. And to provide that information, he turns to a capacity for inexhaustible research and a writing style that moves effortlessly, I think, between insightful art criticism and absolutely compelling journalism. Blake's Warhol is an utterly readable book. It's the only major biography of a major artist I know that is also a page turner. It's a sort of drug. Once you start reading it, you're hooked. It's my genuine pleasure to introduce this year's RCA keynote lecturer, Blake Gopnik, a writer who knows more about Andy Warhol and his ongoing influence on art than anyone alive. Blake. Thank you so much, Robert. That's very sweet of you to say. I have to read the book someday. I've never actually sat down and tried to read it. I hope it is the page turner you say it is. It certainly is for me, but that doesn't count, I guess. I have certainly turned all of its pages. I can't say that I've read them beginning at one and ending at 962. Et je voudrais remercier nos les Canadiens les Canadiens français qui sont avec nous ce soir. La prochaine fois, on va peut-être faire ça en français, mais ce soir c'est en anglais qu'on le fait. Mais je suis très content de prendre des questions en français. 
Uh, we're doing, going to be doing a Q&A at the end of this uh, in the chat. Um, and I think we can probably handle them in English or in French. Um, so please, or rather, I shouldn't say in the chat, I think in the Q&A function at the bottom of Zoom, we're going to be, um, I'm happy to take questions. Hopefully we'll have a good 15 minutes at the end of this for that. Um, uh, so let me just jump right into this. Um, um, uh, let me think, where shall I start? First of all, actually, let me, I do want to say how, how happy I am to be here um, in Canada, in a way. I'm actually on 47th Street in New York as we speak, but uh, I'm here, I'm virtually in Canada and that's a pleasure. I haven't lived in Canada for a long time, but I'm hugely attached to Canada and the Canadian art world, which I think is an incredibly special art world that I miss very much. And that I think that uh, the American art world, the much less sane American art world can learn a thing or two from, from the Canadian art world. So I just want to say how much I appreciate everything that goes goes on in my, my home country and north of the border. Um, but let's get right to Warhol, if we can. I guess the question that I have to ask myself is, I have to ask myself this all the time, is um, why is Warhol still so popular decades and decades after his death and even more decades after his birth? It's kind of surprising in a way that Warhol is as popular and just as importantly as unpopular as he is. That is, for everyone who loves Warhol, there's someone who hates him terribly. And that I think is interesting and important to recognize that he seems to have a very special place in the culture, more than you'd expect in a way for an artist who's been dead for a long time, who, who actually occupies a kind of space in the avant-garde more than really in mainstream culture. So today I want to make a modest proposal. Um, I guess most proposals are labeled as modest, but this one, this one will pretend to be at least. And that's that Warhol gets at Western fine arts essence at the very heart of what western fine art is um it gets at especially the conflicts and the weirdnesses that are there at the very very heart of fine art the weirdness in warhol and warhol's art is matched i think mirrors of genuine strangeness and weirdness at the heart of western fine art that i'm not sure is appreciated often enough so one of the things i want to do today is um is make us aware of that of that strangeness and on that Note, I'll share my screen, hopefully successfully, and let's get an actual Warhol image up. I hope you can all see that. Right now, of course, it is blank, but there's a good classic Warhol image. And it makes my point very clearly, which is that appropriation is the very heart of Andy Warhol's art. And the argument of tonight's talk is that appropriation is also at the very heart of all of Western art, um, and that Warhol keys into the appropriation that I believe and that I'll be arguing is at the very, very heart of all of Western art, the very concept, the heart of the very concept of Western fine art. And of course, the Brillo boxes, in this case, Campbell soup boxes, everyone always says Brillo boxes as though that all of Warhol's boxes were Brillos, but of course they aren't. There's lots of other kind of boxes. Here we've got Campbell's tomato juice boxes. Um, they are the, the classic example of, um, of appropriation, but uh, his earlier show, his earlier works, the Campbell soup cans in uh, that he showed in California in July of 62, are also, I think, more than people realize, an example of appropriation. They look to us like paintings. They are actually paintings on canvas. But when they first appeared in 1962, uh, viewers, critics, um, uh, curators, gallerists, could hardly tell them apart from actual ca um, cans of Campbell soup. Of course, they're paintings, but they stood in so perfectly in the popular imagination, in the critical imagination, for uh, cans of soup that there seemed to be very little distinction. They felt as though people seeing the show felt as though Campbell's soup cans and not works of fine art had been presented to them. And this is interesting. This is actually a photograph that I'm showing here of the installation at the Ferris Gallery in 1962. And you'll see, and this is my reading of this installation, that the picture has been very carefully placed on a rail the kind of rail that would be used not in a supermarket, as is commonly claimed, no one's ever seen Campbell soup cans lined up beautifully with spaces between them. It's the kind of rail that a fine uh, print gallery would use to demonstrate, to show, to sell um, the very highest end of prints. And you'll see there's a label under each one too, as though uh, Irving Blum, the gallerists are trying to underline the fact that these things actually are works of art, even though everyone is reading them as something else. That is, he's underlining in a sense that they've undergone appropriation. They've gone from being part of commercial culture into the world of fine art. So I'm arguing that a 
appropriation is at the very, very, very heart of Andy Warhol's art. It doesn't seem that far-fetched, but I'll give another example. This is uh, his race riot print from 1964. Um, and it shows you that one of the ways in which he appropriates images is that he takes or appropriates phenomena is that he takes images from popular culture, not just objects like soup cans or brillo boxes, but he takes images as well. In fact, Im the images are more central even than anything else. Um, worth pointing out that this is an image that Warhol chose to represent him in a portfolio of 10 artist works, 10 contemporary artist works that was put out by the Wadsworth Athenaeum in 1964. Uh, the reason I mention that is because it's the least transformed just about of any Warhol image you can imagine. It's as close to a straight appropriation as you could get. The contrast has been upped a little bit, but it's essentially the same image that ran in the news of, of these marchers being, being um, beaten and, and uh, attacked by white police officers. It's as straight an example of appropriation as you get when it comes to images by Warhol. Uh, often he does a slight job of artifying the image, I don't think that's central to what he does. So the upping of the contrast, I don't think is central. I think he could have presented the image in a more straightforward way, but he has to artify his images for a couple of reasons. One is to suit a generalized modernist agenda at the time, but also I think just to make clear that the appropriation has gone on, to make very clear, to have a signal, a sign that this has tr been transformed into, into fine art, kind of like the labels that Irving Blum put under the soup, under the um, soup cans even when he's asked to, to decorate a tree for the Hallmark uh, Art Gallery in 1964, he makes it a kind of Duchampian gesture. This is all he does. He just takes a tree and presents it. So even there, at a kind of light moment in his, in his cultural presence, he's still doing something that involves not transformation, but simple presentation, simply, as it were, appropriating the tree from the tree nursery into the gallery. He doesn't change what he's looking at. And I think he does that too. I think the, the next kind of appropriation he indulges in is in his own persona. I think the way he builds his persona, which is, I argue, uh, almost everyone argues, just as important a work of art, if you want, as anything he actually made with his hands, um, that's also a kind of appropriation because none of it comes naturally to him. Um, he doesn't build a persona uh, a strange persona, he actually appropriates personas that were already out there in the world, like the the biker with le the cool cat with um, a leather jacket and, and shades. And those things already came freighted with meaning in the culture at that very moment. They existed in the culture and Warhol appropriates them into his own persona. Um, one observer who recognized that Warhol was doing that, recognized that this wasn't the real Warhol in a sense, said that Warhol adopted a sort of gum-chewing, seemingly naive teeny bopper, or he presented himself, I should say, as a sort of gum-chewing, seemingly naive teeny bopper, addicted to the lowest forms of popular culture. So it's Warhol taking something from popular culture and using it to build his artistic persona. And that happens also when he's at Studio 54 in the, or in the 70s and 80s, when he's turning himself into this kind of po uh, member, a uh, uh, player in popular, and celebrity culture. And what I'm arguing tonight is that all of these acts of appropriation aren't just about the subjects that are appropriated. They're not about, or not only about, Campbell soup cans, um, uh, Studio 54, um, black marchers being attacked by dogs. They're not only about their subjects, they're very much about appropriation. If you want to use a nasty word, they thematize appropriation. They talk about appropriation and its place in Western fine art. And of course it does that. It calls attention to the appropriation by virtue of using objects that aren't, presenting objects that aren't obviously art. It presents objects that could be just groceries or that could just be uh, examples of social climbing or that for that matter, that could simply be financial instruments, right? That's one of the ways in which uh, the objects circulate in the world. And then Warhol, one of the things Warhol does, one of the things that any artist does is take those purely financial instruments and, and transport them, transfer them into the world of fine art, appropriate them into the world of fine art. Now, this isn't only my claim that appropriation is this central. There's an entire theory of art 
that I think is built around appropriation um, without even, in a sense, acknowledging it. And that is what's called the institutional theory of art. That's probably the most established theory about the nature of art that exists right now in sort of the Anglo-American philosophical tradition. It was really uh, launched by Arthur Danto, the great philosopher and critic, and he himself said he really launched it, became involved with it upon seeing Warhol's Burlo boxes. Right? That's what launched Danto's career as a philosopher. And the entire institutional theory of art that follows from Danto's work is built around Danto's 1964 experience of Warhol's Brillo boxes. Um, and the problem, as it were, that the these philosophers are trying to explain is how it can be that art and non-art can be almost indistinguishable, that a Brillo box could be a box in a supermarket um, storeroom and the identical object can also function as art in a, in a gallery. That act of appropriation is what seems central to the whole problem that the institutional theory of art is trying to um, trying to address, and what it what its its problem in a sense is that the cultural decisions that define art seem almost arbitrary. That it takes a community consensus, an art world, is what they call it, to decide what counts as art and what's not. That's what the Brillo boxes prove for Danto and his followers. That you can't have a definition of art based on what art objects look like, what they do for us, how they function because almost anything can become a work of art once the art world, once we people, once we consumers of fine art decide that that's going to be, that's what it's going to be. George Dickey, one of the most important followers from Danto uh, and a critic of, to a certain extent of Danto as well, uh, summed this up by saying, if the history of culture had been a little different, the art world might also be different and include art show, uh, sorry, and include dog shows. So he's saying that art is flexible enough to include dog shows. And in fact, at the Documenta in Castle in 2012, brilliantly talented Canadian artist Brian Jungen presented a dog run. It's not exactly a dog show, but I think it proves uh, George Dickey's point um, fairly well. And I think it proves my point, goes some way towards proving my point, or will, hopefully, by the end of this talk, that appropriation that appropriating a dog run into the world of fine art in in castle for instance as a kind of ultimate test case is at the very very root of western art in fact i'm arguing that it's not some weird thing that happens in the 21st century or the post duchamp in 20th century but it's there at the very very root of of all art and i want to just take a little i want to just have a little parenthesis here to say that i want to recognize that this is weird and ridiculous that most cultures don't use fine art in this way that this is a very strange thing this is a central argument i'm making today that it's a very unusual way to use visual culture to use visual objects most uh, other um cultures don't use them this way and we'll get to what that way is in a minute and they don't and we didn't use them for most of the, the so-called western past it's a it's a particular invention so I'd rather, in fact, I don't like the word fine art. I, if I had my druthers, I'd call it just strange art. I'd like to emphasize the peculiarity, the arbitrariness, the, the, um, the, the uh, ridiculousness of the whole concept of fine art, which for me is what makes it powerful. I want to make clear that it's no finer than other kinds of, I don't even want to use the art word art really, that other uses for visual culture. It's strange, just stranger um than them and i think it's important to recognize that the reason western culture has attached va uh, value-laden words like fine to our concept of art is actually to try to hide that strangeness in a say in a sense by attaching concepts like beauty to, by attaching financial value by attaching social value to this particular category of fine art i think it's actually a way of covering up how bizarre it is how weird it is how strange this act of appropriation, as I'll talk about in a minute, is from the very, very beginning. And the reason I think Warhol's so central to this, to understanding this and to the discussion and to the use of appropriation in art is because in fact, he understood this better than most because he was born to a certain extent outside of the culture of fine art. He was born as a poor immigrant in Pittsburgh into a very different culture, a different social world, a different social class, um, a different language for that matter. 
than was normal in the world of fine art. And he could recognize, I think, the profound strangeness of fine art in a way that that other people might not have 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 done. And that's why I think he chose to make it his subject and could make it his subject, because I think it was foreign enough to him that he could see it. But I do want to say, and this is really just a little aside, um, uh, aimed in a sense at Ruth Phillips, of course, who we're also honoring tonight. Um, I want to say that, and Ruth maybe in the question period can can talk about this for a minute, that this is an, an option that can be available in all cultures, obviously. All, all options are available in some sense to everyone, if it's an option at all for culture. And it has sometimes been picked up on in other cultures, and we don't have time to dwell on that tonight. But I will mention the quilt makers of G's Bend, because there's fabulous video interviews with them where they seem to be adopting exactly some of the concepts that uh, Matisse or Picasso uh, might, have, might have used to explain what they were doing. That is, it seems as though that microculture at G's Bend has exactly the same fine art concepts that are there in the larger culture, and maybe not because of contact with that culture, but through simultaneous invention. So I want to make very clear that this is an extremely strange invention that I'll be talking about in a minute, but it's available to everyone. Okay, close parenthesis. Um, we still have a dog run up on the screen. I should have put a blank slide in so we didn't have to watch that for quite that long. Um, so here's my central claim that fine art, this very strange phenomenon I've been going on about, was actually born at a particular moment in Italy around 1500. And not only was it born, but it was born in an act of appropriation. Earlier pictures, earlier objects of visual culture had much clearer functions, had clear functions in Western society, or at any rate functions that could, that can, could and can be, be figured out to a certain extent. You know, some objects were used to uh, to reach God, to talk to God, to be in touch with God, to please God more than anything else. You know, here's a here's the San Damiano crucifix from around maybe 1100 in Assisi in the Church of Santa Chiara. You can imagine people praying to it. You can imagine people um, uh, asserting certain values that this object had, functional values that this object had. Other objects, of course, could be used to mark social status, could talk about the money that, that in this case, donors had, the donors who gave an altarpiece, right? These are by Petrus Christus from around 1455. Objects like these seem to have relatively clear kinds of cultural functions. But the art historian, Alex Nagel, who was at the University of Toronto for a long time, and in fact, is a Canadian citizen as well. He's now at, at the Institute of Fine Arts at NYU here in New York, um, but he has a Canadian connection, so I can't help mentioning that. Um, he documents a change from around 1500 and has analyzed that change and anxiety around a change that happened in around 1500. And here's a good example of it. This is Domenico Ghirlandaio's Birth of the Virgin from the Tornaboni Chapel around 1485, uh, 1490 in uh, the Church of Santa Maria Novella in Florence. Now, around this time, Girolamo Savonarola, the great Dominican preacher, is preaching, inveying, taking power, in fact, in Florence. And one of the things he's doing is attacking the artfulness of images just like this. He said they distracted from the proper sacred functions of works. There was something wrong with these works. Their artfulness was a problem. He said, the figures you have made in the churches are in the likeness of one or another woman, which is very badly done and in great disregard for what is God's. That is, he's talking about figures like this, right? These are the women who are supposed to be attending on the birth of the Virgin, and they're very clearly neighbors to the people who be looking at this fresco, right? They're clearly Florentine ladies who somehow or other have crept into the, the room where, where the Virgin has just been born. Um, um, so this, and so Saronarola felt there was a problem with that, right? This was, these were non, functional elements in a picture that should have been pure, had purely sacred functions. And as Alex Alexander Nagel explained it, he said um, that viewers uh, who ought to have been put in mind of God when they were looking at his painter, at, at the paintings, um, are instead engaging, as Nagel said, in the pleasurable activity of pictorial analysis. That is, they're looking at the picture to see their friends, to see also how well their friends are painted, 
by the artist. They were the congregation that is, is distracted by the manner in which the figures have been worked. That's a Catholic reformer, Hieronymus Enser, uh, put it that way in 1522. All of these things that pertain to art that don't pertain to the sacred are creeping in. So what's happening, I think, is that works of art are creeping into a new category. I should say works of visual culture are creeping into a new category, which will come to be called fine art. They're starting to be objects of analysis and contemplation. People are asking, what's this thing for? What's in it? What kind of pleasure can I get from it? The pious functions are being supplanted. Just, and you know, here's obviously me, the Warhol biographer talking, just as the function, the marketing function of boxes, uh, cartons for Brillo pads are being supplanted by, um, by uh, artistic functions once Warhol takes the cartons and more or less transfers them into the world of fine art, appropriates them into fine art. Again, in the words of, words of Alex Nagel, images are under suspicion as objects constitutionally inclined to becoming works of art, fabrications of their makers, rather than serious bearers of referential content, that their central nature is as fabricated objects that respond to questions, in a sense, rather than giving answers. Now, to deal with this, there was the Savonarola option, right? To, to deal with this new problem in fine art. And his option was burn the damn things, right? Bonfire the vanity, set fire to them, get rid of this category of fine art, prevent it from taking hold, return objects, uh, churches to uh, purely sacred functions. In fact, an another reformer at the same moment said we should just get rid of all the new art and there should just be traditional icons or images like traditional icons on the walls. But there was another option as well that another reformer, a patron of Martin Luther actually, a man called Franz von Sickingen suggested, which was, and here's here, this is sort of the heart of my talk in a sense, appropriate them from their sacred use into a new category, into the new category of fine art, a category that, that doesn't have religious needs, religious functions, religious implications anymore. In a sense, you could say that Franz von Sickingen is, by that very suggestion, creating a new category of fine art. He said, don't destroy these objects, take them out of the churches and study them for their art. This is him speaking, their art, their beauty, their magnificence, by placing them in fine rooms in people's, in rich people's houses, in mansions, in palazzi. Religious object that is, he said, should be appropriated to receive, in fact, just the kind of attention that we give them today, right, in museums. Our fine rooms are museums. And where are they? They're right down the hall from the Warhols that are also in museums. Franz von Singen is creating the category of fine art, and everyone in his world, everyone at his moment in, um, in, your, in Italy, but also, of course, in, in the elites in Northern Europe, are actively creating the new category of fine art that rules ever since, in a sense, rules part of Western culture, ever since a small part, a strange part, a weird corner of Western culture that uses images in these particular ways. And just as a little aside, my once upon a time, long ago, I was actually a Renaissance art historian. I worked on the nature of realism in the 16th century, what realism did mean, what it could mean. And one of the things that, that I'll say based on that is that what I think what happens partly is the new realism of, and I'm using that word very loosely, illusionism is a word I prefer probably, the new realism that's born, you know, around 1425, 1450, 1500, depending how you want to date it, always leaves too much for the eye to take in. There's always a residue from the immediate function of the, of the image, and that causes the problem of fine art. Um, there's always, there are other, always things to look at that surpass the function of the object as a sacred work. You know, you can look at, for instance, how much the figures look like your neighbors, how gorgeous and classical the room is. Look at the frieze in this image by Ghirlandaio. Right? There's actually an infinite remainder of things that don't have to do with the function of the work necessarily, that leave function unspecified in a lot of the ways, that ask us to ask the question, what can we use this for? What can we use this detail for? What is this thing for? 
They ask for discussion, for discourse, a discussion of the artfulness of the object, a discussion in the sense of the object in terms of its weird new status as this new thing called art. And I'll just point out, it's exactly the discussion that happened when Warhol first presented his Campbell soup cans at the Ferris Gallery. What are these things? They don't look like art, but they're being presented as art. What do we do with them? Discourse, discursivity, as I think, and I think that most of the theoreticians, most of the institutional theoreticians of art would agree that discourse is central to the weirdness of Western art. And I think that actually has to do with the act of appropriation. Appropriation triggers discourse, if you like. Now, one of the things that happens around 1500 is that some artists start creating works that actually demand to be addressed as art, that are strange enough that they can't just be addressed as functional objects anymore. Objects that drew attention to their lack, in a sense, of obvious function. In a way, the way uh, Warhol drew attention to the lack of function in the Brillo boxes by putting them in a gallery space, right? By underlining their sudden weird lack of function. Well, that happens in a sense in around 1500. Again, uh, this has been explained by, um, by Alex Nagel with a couple of examples. Oh, that was supposed to be up a minute ago. Um, uh, you may know the picture on the left here. Some of you may have seen it before. I'm not going to tell you what that is, but on the right is a lovely, lovely self-portrait by Dürer from around 1500 by Albert Dürer. Um, and both of these, these pictures, as Alex Nagel has, has, has written, um, quote earlier sacred icons. They, they demand a viewer to ask, what kind of thing am I looking at? As he puts it, as Nagel puts it, these portraits destabilize the subject of portraiture leaving the figurations in a suspended, indeterminate state. They don't even work in a straightforward way as commemorative portraits. They ask questions of what they are as portraits, and especially the juror, because juror is presenting himself exactly as Christ is normally presented. Um, uh, there's a particular, actually a particular set of texts about what Christ looked like, and they describe him as looking exactly the way Dürer looks in this picture, and there's a set of images as well. So Dürer is really complicating the status of his own portrait, and, and in fact, the Mona Lisa is doing the same thing too. They become, again, sorry to quote Alex Nagel one more time, they become a reflection on the portrait as a category, and thus on art making generally. They are about the nature of art very much in the way Warhol's uh, soup cans, Warhol's um, uh, uh, Warhol's um, Brillo boxes, in fact, everything Warhol ever did, including, I would say, his portraits. Warhol's portraits are also about the nature of representation, the nature of portraiture. They're unstable. This is not simply a commemoration of Marilyn, right? This doesn't sit easily in any of the normal categories. Uh, of what a portrait can and should do, it forces us to ask questions about what it's doing. And as we'll see in a, a little later in my talk, uh, the photograph it was based on didn't force us to do this. The act of appropriating the image into fine art automatically changes its, its nature. And with the, with the jury, you could say, in a sense, the opposite. By virtue of changing the nature of the portrait, by virtue of putting itself in question, it turned itself into a work of fine art. It appropriated, you could say, the whole category of portraiture, of stable portraiture, of commemorative portraiture, and brought that into the category, the flexible, indeterminate category of fine art. Now, we'll stay in the Renaissance for just a little bit longer, because I just love the art so much. And it's very important for me, in everything I do as a critic, in a sense, to, to acknowledge continuities within at least this tradition of fine art from 1500 in the West to today in the West. And I, it's very important for me to recognize as well that this is a self-contained tradition in, in important ways and to understand it as this very peculiar cultural form. And I want that to be true of understanding the 16th century as well as the 21st century. So some painters in the 16th century actually seem to have gone out of their way to undermine the determinacy of their own subject matter. Here's a good example of that. This is Giorgione's Three Philosophers from about 1505. Experts today can't settle on the subject. That's why they give it a lame title like the Three Philosophers, because they actually can't figure out what it is. There are all sorts of guesses. Experts 
art historians try and have always tried, by the way, observers have always tried to figure out what this is, um, but it's not clear there is a specific subject that can be settled on. All it is is uh, an excuse for thinking about what it might be about, you could say, and that Giorgione planned it that way. In fact, there's some evidence that Giorgione deliberately reworked the picture to be less legible, to have a less clear subject over the course of painting the thing. And again, as Alexander Nagel describes this, because I'm basing a lot of today's talk on his, on his research, as I said, I used to be a Renaissance art historian, and I'm still completely obsessed with the, with the field, um, that a picture like this is meant to experiment with figures with no labels, to expose the inner workings of the image on this side of stable denotation. And I would say this side of stable denotation is the side of fine art. That it's about a search for meaning. I think I used this phrase earlier, not the delivery of meaning. And that's the hallmark of this strange category that I think is born in appropriation uh, around 1500, this category of fine art. Now, one of the important things is that it's not a stable category and it applies to all works of visual culture or all works of fine art, you could say, after 1500. Once a search for meaning becomes available as a mode, once you start imagining that one of the things objects do is just trigger investigations of what they are, that function, that possibility, exists side by side with all standard functions of works of art. So you get a picture like this, right? Goya's great Charles IV of Spain and his family, to use the English title for it. It kind of looks like a standard commemorative portrait, a standard royal family picture, but it's impossible not also to read it as possibly being critical. We look at it and wonder why are they more, aren't these figures flattered more successfully? Why do half them look like idiots, which in fact they were. This was one of the more corrupt and useless uh, monarchies in a long history of corrupt and useless monarchies in Western culture. Um, the, this picture, which could be straightforwardly functional, because it's within the ambit of this category of fine art, always also begs to be interpreted in other ways. We take any little clue to strangeness and read that uh, for uh, slippery meanings. We want to read into the picture, not just use it in a straightforward way. And that I think is also, we'll jump right here, to Warhol society portraits. I think that's equally true of these. Um, they can easily seem just to fulfill a straightforward role in society, to earn Warhol money, to flatter rich people. But I think because they're in the category of fine art and Warhol's in the category of fine artist, they automatically um, also invite more complicated readings, critical readings. In fact, my reading is that this, his entire project as a society portraiter was a portraitist was essentially critical, like Goya's was. So I, what, what I'd wanna say about this is that Warhol's pop work doesn't only cap a 500 year tradition, it reflects on that tradition and it puts its origins on view that one of the greatnesses of Warhol, one of the reasons he's so important to us and continues to be important to us. And also one of the reasons he's so hated is because he, he represents the entire category of fine art. He's figured out how it is to put that on display. The, the problems at the heart of fine art, the appropriation that launches the category of fine art is made clearer in Warhol than in just about any other artist you can imagine. And I'll just drop Marcel Duchamp's name here because Often people will say, well, Duchamp did all that before. I think Duchamp's fundamentally different, even though, of course, his, his urinal and a couple of other ready-mades were appropriations. I think you can argue that they were meant to end fine art, in fact. And that's the rhetoric that, that Duchamp used around them. Whereas War Warhol is using, recognizing that appropriation is at the heart of Western fine art, that all of Western fine art is, in, in a sense, Duchamp's fountain is, is a urinal turned into a work of art, that that's fundamental. And Warhol uses that not to end art, but to continue art, to make art, and to reflect on art. And with Warhol, it's by pretending, or rather by seeming functional, right? All of his work seems as though it has a more straightforward function underlying it, you know, from a Campbell's soup can image, which could of course just be a way of selling Campbell's soup 
to a Brillo box, which just seems, in fact, to be the actual box, but also these objects here, the society portraits, which, as I said, seem simply to be ways of flattering very rich people and taking their money. And in fact, all of, or I shouldn't say all, much of Warhol's late art can seem on at first glance to simply be a, uh, the, the invention of a commodity. And then you have to ask yourself, well, is it actually a commodity or is it a commodity that's been appropriated into fine art? And even I can't answer which one is which, but both of those things are always in play. So I think that that's what really matters, is that Warhol has us looking at, asks us to look, wants to present objects always as the kinds of objects that need to be questioned. And I love this photograph, and I'll end with this photograph, because it's so clear that these people are, uh, I think it's clear that they're perplexed, they don't know what to do with it, right? If they really bought these works as fine art in the traditional sense, they wouldn't be leaning on it. The two gentlemen wouldn't be leaning on them. There's a sense, and in all the talk about Brillo boxes, that there's something wrong. And I'll just end by saying it sounds very much like Savonarola talking about fine art. Something has gone wrong, the categories are slipping, and that's why the Brillo boxes are so problematic. And that's why Warhol is so great and problematic to all of us, that he captures that uh, insane moment in 1500. And instead of saying, let's burn down art, as you could say Duchamp did, he said, no, no, this is art. This is the greatness of art, and I'm going to give it to you. And you'll celebrate it for, what are we at now since his, since his death? 40 years now. So thanks very much. I'd love any questions that people can think of. I'm happy to, to entertain them. Thanks, thanks for your time. Let me unshare my screen. Hmm. There we go. Thank you all. I appreciate your time. Well, now it's it's back to to Robert Toombs. We have a few Roberts on the on the call. Uh, I want to thank uh, both uh, Robert Enright uh, for his uh, very poignant introduction of Blake and also for his contributions you know as a writer uh over the years and i'd like to thank you blake also for your wonderful talk and uh, and for uh your uh, your entertaining personality um and for for the great work of uh that you've recently delivered the the tome warhol so um we'd like to go to a, a q a uh format here and um I, I've got a question that I'd like to start out with, but um, our uh, administrator, assistant curator, Nick Cooper is gonna be managing the uh, chat function, which we'd like, to, if you'd like to ask questions, I don't know how many will be coming in, but she'll be uh, maybe uh, cherry picking some questions, but I'd like to, Blake, if I could just start off with one. Um, this question also was 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 conceived by by uh, Nick. Um, can you talk about the relationship between duration in Warhol's films and repetition in his screen prints? Are these medium specific methods getting at the same point or achieving the same thing? That's an interesting question. Um, it's it's a hard one uh, with all of Warhol because he both seems incredibly fast and incredibly slow at the same time, right? Uh, repetition capture in the screen prints captures that quality, uh, kind of staccato machine gun quality, right? So on the one hand, it seems to be about the whatever it is one sixteenth of a second that a frame is on is on view in a film. Um, but it also seems to prolong looking, right? You look at one image after another, and even the variations between the different, the different impressions on one of those repeated silk screens asks you to study each one to stay longer with the picture. So there's the tension there, and that's true also. I mean, I'm one of the relatively few, probably very few people who sat through all eight and a half hours or eight hours, it's actually slightly under eight hours of Warhol's empire, you know, his static footage of the, of the Empire State Building. And there's certainly a tendency to, for people to imagine, oh, you don't have to look at the thing, glance at it quickly and you've got it and then you can walk out of the room. But when you're actually there, there's a very strange, so there, it seems fast in that way. It also seems incredibly slow, especially in people's imaginations. They imagine sitting for eight hours, 
But when you're actually doing the sitting, of course it seems slow, but you're so attentive to micro phenomena, right? Because so little is going on. There's always something going on. There's always a flicker of thread uh, in the projector. In fact, there's, there are planes flying by, you know, the flash of lights from planes. There are little tiny things that happen that make you incredibly attentive to the instant, to the, to the quick, not to the long. And that's a tension that's there in Warhol, but I'll also say it's a vital tension that's there in all of Western fine art. That tension between an instant grasp of function, an instant grasp for that matter of the visual qualities of a picture, and the temptation that I think is fundamental to Western fine art to engage in discourse, to talk it through, to stay longer, to be involved with it. That's what, you don't really have to do that. I mean, I assume that a sacred relic or an icon functioning as a relic can work very quickly, right? You say, however any Hail Mary's in front of it, or you just kiss it, and it's done its sacred work. Um, fine art doesn't allow that. Fine art always asks for yet another question, always invites yet another question. By definition, if it's functioning as fine art, there's more to say about it. That's what makes it fun art, in fact. Well, I don't, th that, that's a great answer. Uh, um, uh, Nick, I don't know if we have your audio on. Do you, have yes. You, uh, so thank you so much, Blake. Um, I've invited two people to be able to speak who I'm seeing come up as they do in the order. So we have the first question from Layla. So if you want to turn your mic on, you should be able to. And then we have Udo after Layla. Hey, can you hear me? Yes. Hello, Layla. Oh. Okay, wonderful. Hello. Thank you, Blake, so much. This is absolutely wonderful to hear uh, this is about the third talk, and they're always different and always wonderful and extremely generous. Um, thank you. I, I have a, about three questions. Um, I That's very interesting I, that Frank von Zingingen was the first one to say, well, take, every, take the art out of the church and place it in the homes. Was, is this particularly in the um, Italian Renaissance Savonarola, Savonarola uh, context? Because I understood it was Luther it, with his argument with Karlstadt in Germany, Karlstadt wanting to poke out all the eyes of Madonnas and chop off their heads and so forth, um, seeing the, the image of the woman uh, or of the, these, looking at these, being more Catholic than the Catholics and thinking that the images had to be murdered in the churches in order to, um, and Luther saying, well, let's, let's take them and put them in the living rooms of the German homes and enjoy them as art, but they don't have to be destroyed and we don't want to use them as golden uh, cattle, uh, as golden calves and so forth. Yeah. Um, that's, that's, a tension, that's a tension that's there uh, throughout yeah. all of reform, both Catholic reform yeah. and Protestant reform. And it's yeah. a tension that sort of survives pretty much I mean, in religious circles, certainly to this day, and predates the Renaissance as well. So it's there all along. Um, uh, but what's interesting is that there is at just that moment, both, as I said, in the North and, the, and in Italy, there mm -hmm. is that possibility of transferring them. And that's actually true of music as well, right? The question yeah. about what you should do yeah. with secret music is the same question. And you get the yeah. same answer that maybe even if you bar singing in church, it's fine to do it at home. Yeah. And it's a tension that, that never goes away at all. Yeah. Well, th the other question is, is absolutely revolutionary. I mean, what you're saying, or I guess, I don't know whether this is through uh, Alex Nagel, um, I wasn't sure. Um, th this your thesis about appropriation, which completely throws out the window the whole idea of sort of the the artist being the absolute creative source and sort of being a naive child that. Um, I uh, hope like, I throw it out the window. I'd be happy yeah, if yeah. I threw the naive child out the window. Yeah, I was like throwing yeah. out window. Yeah, but, but I keep on I keep on thinking of Mike Kelly with his his idea of you know repression and of of, of uh, just using the ready-made and appropriation a lot as well, uh, being quite similar in a way to what some, some of the things that, that uh, Warhol did. Um, of and it completely yeah. throws out a lot of art pedagogy today with the, you know, the idea of, uh, of being absolutely original and you know, not wanting- Oh, well, I, see, I don't think it does that at all. No? No, because um, there's certainly tons and tons of originality in appropriation. We're talking at a meta level yeah. here. And if I'd had more yeah, time, I would have talked yeah. about that. 
But I think we should let some other people ask questions or we're going to be, we're not going to get yeah. enough questions in. Okay. Yes, we can go, we can go to Udo and then after Udo, we have um, Jennifer Macklem. And there are questions happening in the Q&A, which you're welcome to sort of have little chatty debates if you'd like over there. Yeah, here's Udo. My question follows right uh, um, the, the previous question. Um, first of all, thank you. Uh, it, illuminating talk. Uh, it, I think I saw art for 50 years in a different way. And uh, it's fascinating how you explained it. The question is, what triggered in the Renaissance that change, that fundamental change, and uh, which created fine arts in the first place? Uh, was it the, the schism in the church? Was it the strengthening of the bourgeoisie? What, what triggered this fundamental change in seeing art? Ah, that's a, that's a hell of a big question. Um, I think partly, I know this sounds crazy, but I think the invention of perspective, which is essentially a technological invention. Now you could ask, why did they invent perspective? And that's, you know, Michael Baxendall has answers to that. But I do think that once you get perspectival pictures, once you get a certain level of realism, and it doesn't have to be perfectly perspectival because this happens in the North as well, you do have a residue of non-functional elements in a picture that demand um, uh, analysis that have to be dealt with by viewers. And I, so I do think that's one answer. Um, you know what, it's in a sense, I'm not qualified to answer that question uh, since I'm not sure that there are many art historians who can do it. I'm happy just to point out that something happens at that moment. Causality in history, as everyone knows, is really tricky to, to figure out. And I think sometimes I'll actually go out on a limb and say, maybe there aren't always causalities. There's simply things that happen sometimes and you're never gonna get a good causal explanation because in fact, um, other things might have happened. It might not have happened uh, that there was, that fine art was invented. They might've decided, no, this is of no interest. We want functional images. And I do wanna emphasize that at every moment that you've got a non-functional fine art image, it's quite possible that it has straightforward function in, functions in the society as well. Fine art is, what's the right word? A, a functionality of a work, uh, a means of operating for work, it's not inherent in the object itself. So every object, I mean, every Warhol, of course, is also a financial instrument. Um, every object, every Warhol could be used, I guess, as an ironing board as well, to, to quote from Duchamp, to steal from Duchamp. So I, um, I think the, the notion of using works as, a, as fine art has, is different from the invention of particular kinds of objects around 1500, I guess is, is what I'd probably say. But as you can tell, I'm, I'm, I'm fishing here. I'm fishing. I don't have a good answer for you. Thanks so much. Um, Jennifer, did you want to read out your question? Um, yeah, sorry. I keep, I keep thinking I'm muted and then I'm not. Sorry about that. So anyway, thank you again for the lively discussion and stimulation for thinking. Um, I was just wondering what you think about this. It's because I kind of had a different reading of Warhol. So in my reading Warhol, was also paying attention to the way that capitalism, consumerism, materialism was beginning to engulf the Western world and eventually the whole industrialized world like a rising tide that submerged whole generations. As we critique neoliberalism uh, today, listening to post-colonial perspectives, it seems that Warhol was very astute, creating, creating art that was a stark and playful reflection of the dominant culture. I don't know. Is that, is yeah, that too soon? Absolutely. That was one of the most dominant readings, at least by the smartest critics of, of his time. And luckily, he, he was incredibly lucky to have started his pop art career at any rate, surrounded by very young, very, very smart, and unfortunately quite troubled critics, some, some of whom didn't live long. Um, Gene Swenson is one of the best of them, who's sort of underknown now as a critic. Um, yes, absolutely. Those are absolutely functions that the Warhol's uh, objects played play, for that matter. Um, I was really talking about a uh, kind of meta function, as I said before, that they play. That is, they draw attention to appropriation, even as they do this other work, right? But I think it's important to recognize that the fact that we look at them in that way, um, that we ask, what do these works do? Do they critique capitalism or, for that matter, celebrate capitalism, which is another uh, reading of them, common reading of them. The very fact that we ask those kind of questions, that in a sense, we don't know what to do with these objects. They look prima facie like soup cans and Brillo boxes, but then we ask all these other questions of them. Well, in the very fact that they do that, in the very fact that they 
ask us to ask those questions. They're also drawing attention to the very nature of fine art and to the fact that appropriation is at the heart of it. But yes, I completely agree with you that they are extremely interesting um, reflections on capitalism and consumer culture and mass culture, all of those things. I think that's absolutely clear and necessary. Yeah, I, I, I do appreciate how you're pointing out how uh, when there's various perspectives that are sort of troubled and we don't necessarily know how to read um, something, we don't necessarily know how to categorize it. Um, that's that's kind of one of the purposes of art. It's that, it's that, that troubling of interpretation, that troubling of um, positioning. So And deeply weird. I mean, I think it's really important to recognize that is a weird thing to do, that what we are now doing is a very, very strange thing to do that we'll endlessly question how to use this object. You know, we don't do that with most objects. We don't do it with with uh, a Brillo box when we're in the supermarket, right? When it, we're unpacking Brillo pads from the Brillo carton. We don't do it if we, if we were to use a Warhol as an ironing board, we would simply iron on it. We wouldn't discuss the nature of ironing boards. The particular art ha is a very, very Western fine art, or I'll call it Western strange art, is a very peculiar uh, cultural form. And I really want to draw attention to that. And it draws attention to itself, in a sense, in that in just that way. Thank you. Great. <laughs> well, maybe Nick, we have one one. Do we have time for one more? Do you have any more questions? Yeah, I think I might be able to summarize somebody's question kind of quickly. Um, doesn't seem like there's anybody else, and we do have the exciting award ceremony to get to. <laughs> we did have somebody who was wondering um about Warhol's philosophy providing us with significant meaning for globalization of non-western art to a wider audience uh interesting complicated um yeah I mean the the relationship between western fine art and visual cultures other visual cultures is very complicated Warhol didn't address it a whole lot he did in in small ways he did in his collecting more than anything because he in fact did collect uh non-western kinds of art um, Native American textiles, um, among others, uh, principally, um, but also um, some other uh, non-Western art forms. Um, and now I feel as though I've lost my train of thought. But it is it is a major, major question. Um, what happens when works of art, for, work, sorry, I should say, vi visual objects from non-Western cultures get brought into museums? Um, I think that's a fundamental act of appropriation. It's the same act of appropriation that happened in 1500 when works were taken, f at least theoretically, were imagined being taken from churches and put into fine rooms for contemplation, for pleasure. Um, it's very much the same uh, disorienting act that goes on. And I, I must say, I don't think the art world has been good at all at understanding that. There's been a leveling of visual culture as though Western fine art and other cultures, forms of visual art, are somehow on the same, doing the same kind of work. I think too often we don't recognize the profound dis difference between them that needs to be negotiated, if nothing else. And again, I reject the notion that fine art is elevated in any way. I don't like the word fine. It's a different cultural tradition. It certainly isn't better. It's just a whole lot stranger. Thank you, that's so excellent. Uh, maybe just to close this before the award ceremony, uh, Ruth Phillips, because you did kind of bring her in. I feel like we should just make a little space for her um, to maybe have a comment and then we can wrap up. Yeah, of course. I think you should be able to unmute yourself, Ruth. I did. Can you hear me? Yes, indeed. Yeah. Thank you, Blake. I, I've been sort of biting my tongue here because I've been waiting a very long time for an art historian trained in the Renaissance to call Western fine art weird. <laughs> As a, a scholar, it, it was very, very uh, apropos <laughs> to talk about appropriation. And you've just said it in your in your last remark that it's really at the heart of the colonization projects now. But what I would put to you, and this probably is a too big a question for to answer in the time that we've got, is the question of the aesthetic and the beauty as a, a key characters characteristic of that fine art category for a very long time, up until fairly recently. Um, because the power of objects, as, when they're used in sacred uh, and other political uh, ceremonials, is enhanced often by being made beautiful or aesthetically compelling. But it isn't dependent on that. And it seems to me that this category of fine art in the appropriation is defined in terms of aesthetic quality. And it's 
I just have to say it's not missing from other cultures at all, but it isn't the supreme value. And it's just a it's a question and a comment, but I yeah. think you know if we could push the whole the whole very stimulating uh, uh, analysis you've given into that space if we had time. <laughs> yeah, I totally agree. I think beauty is almost always a red herring. It's almost always incoherent. I think often it's actually again a way of covering up the weirdness, right? If you say there's a function to, to fine art, to Western fine art that's in terms of beauty, that's understood in terms of beauty, you don't have to acknowledge the weirdness because it seems straightforward, right? There's this thing called beauty that we're seeking. But I think if you look at the history of beauty, it's almost completely incoherent. And I totally agree that there are concepts of the beautiful that are, if not discussed, at least uh, active in all cultures. But I don't think I'd want to ever conflate beauty and fine art as categories and see them as necessarily that closely related. So I think that it's, it is, again, a kind of conceptual red herring to say, well, and this is, of course, what's been said forever. Well, every culture has a concept of beauty. That might be, but that doesn't mean that every culture is engaged in the same concept of, of what the visual is and certainly that every culture adopts fine art. So I'm extremely interested in beauty, but I'm, I'm troubled by it. And I think it's, it takes up way too much space in, in, and has taken up too much space in the rhetorics of Western, Western fine art. Agreed. Thank you. Lovely. That was a treat. Thank you, Ruth. I, I can't imagine a better interlocutor in the country like this. Well, I hope we can continue this one day. <laughs> oh, absolutely. I guess, Blake, maybe that might be the last question, unless you have any further remarks. No, I'm, I'm just incredibly pleased to have done this. It's really a privilege to have tried out some of these ideas on you. They're still, as you can tell, uh, very much in utero. I haven't published them anywhere. I'm just working through them and there's a lot more work to be done on them. But I really appreciate your patience and listening. And again, I wish I was there with you in the flesh, partly to be with you guys, but partly just to be in Canada again. I do get up occasionally, but not as often as I'd like. So thank you for having me and congratulations to all the new inductees at the RCA. It's a, it's a fabulous thing. Yeah, and thanks to you, Blake, and also Robert Enright for, for your, uh, your great contributions.